So I'd like to share with you an idea today that I personally find wondrous. It's an idea that truly brings me a sense of peace. And so I think it's one worth spreading. But let me start from the beginning. This is my two-year-old son, Bodhi, our two-year-old son, doing his best Matthew McConaughey impersonation. <laughs> one of Bodhi's first two-syllable words was apple. For a time there, every red object was an apple. Every fruit, every veggie, an apple. It seemed as if everything was apple. We asked him, so hey, Bodhi, what do you want to name your tortoise? Apple juice, of course. <laughs> so over the next year, Bodhi began to differentiate. He learned that his red ball was not an apple and nor were tomatoes. During this critical period of his development, those life experiences associated with apples, their unique shape, the sound and feel of that crunching sensation, his life experiences were literally sculpting his neural architecture, pruning away superfluous connections between neurons. The paltry hundred trillion or so connections that remained were far more precise but less apt to change. My point, we are conditioned from very early on to see apples as different, separate from, say, oranges. It's apples and oranges, right? And I know this is all part of growing up, but I sometimes wonder if maybe Bodhi didn't have it right from the get-go, and everything is apple. So right now, your mind is telling you exactly what it was sculpted to tell you, that this is clearly a discrete object that exists independently. I'm here today because it's an illusion. It's simply a mental construct. When we look deeply, this apple exists only in the sense that it relates to all things. In the words of John Muir, it's, it's hitched to everything else in this universe. And so you're likely thinking <laughs> that's a little out there and you're thinking all that, Neo, there is no spoon, is a complete and total load <laughs> of apple juice the tortoise crap. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds a bit mystical, I'm a population ecologist. I'm currently examining black bear demographics on the East Coast. As a scientist, I am fully aware that skepticism is the road less traveled. That we as a species, we tend to find meaningful pattern in meaningless noise. That's a flower, it's an orchid. That being said, over the years, I've found growing evidence from the strange realms of quantum physics and from my own discipline of ecology that seems to support a very old Buddhist philosophical idea known as Pratita Samutpada in Sanskrit. And I probably butchered that, but it literally translates as to be by co-emergence or more loosely interdependence. The best I've ever heard the concept described is by a molecular geneticist turned Buddhist monk named Matthew Ricard. He explains an event or an object like this rainbow. It can only happen because it's produced by a suite of causes and conditions. It's just the way that we perceive this flow of events that crystallizes certain aspects of a truly non-separable universe it creates this illusion that we're immersed in a reality that's composed of all of these independent objects that are separate from us. So I've been pretty lucky over the years. Uh, as an ecologist, I've had the chance to study systems on opposite sides of the planet. And again and again, it seems like when we try to isolate and examine ecological relationships, we find them hitched to everything else. So, for example, as a grad student, I, I spent three summers jumping out of helicopters in Montana's Blackfoot Valley trying to capture those guys, newborn calf elk. This was a decade ago uh, when wolves were first returning to many parts of Montana. So there was understandable concern about how this novel predator would impact elk populations. 
Our goal was to mark these newborn calves with radio transmitters, so ultimately we could quantify both the sources and the rates of their mortality. In our first year of study, we lost an astounding 71% of our marked sample. Bears alone very efficiently went through and picked off 40% of the newborn calves. That's what you see up there on the right. So at this point, we're feeling like we've got this system figured out. Well, in years two and three, we lost 11 and 14% of our sample compared to 71% in year one. So what was going on? When we took a look at the weather data, that first year was one of the coldest and driest springs in over 100 years of records, during which time stressed out elk mothers gave birth to calves that were significantly lighter and then grew more slowly. Meanwhile, all that highly nutritious spring vegetation that these bears voraciously consume when they come out of winter dens, it was largely absent that frigid spring, forcing these omnivores to really go after those calves. So the dynamics of an entire elk herd was fundamentally driven by year-to-year -year changes in the survival of those little calves which was then linked to the frequency of the bear predation. Bear predation itself was determined by how susceptible the calves were in the first place and the lack of other spring bear foods, which was hitched to changes in spring temperature and precipitation. This often subtle but underlying interdependence is not unique to this system either. So in the Tongass National Forest in southeast Alaska, forest clear cuts mandated under Reagan affected the biomass of tiny plant communities decades later, which then affected both the distribution and the productivity of Sitka black-tailed deer and then the threatened gray wolves on top of that. On the Andaman coast in Thailand, hard corals were less likely to be overgrown with algae when sharks were not fished out. Because these apex predators, these sharks, they kept the mid-tier predators in check, which then allowed the herbivorous fish to get large enough to graze back the algae. This fundamental interdependence, it holds below the surface as well at the genetic level. So again, uh, uh, we see, um, we, here we see two species, uh, brown bear and polar bear with a clear demarcation between the two. Richard Dawkins calls it our, our discontinuous mind. Uh, but evolution is a continuous process. The brown bear and polar bear lineages are truly hitched, not only by a common ancestor, but by gene pools that have separated and collided and separated over some five million years. What's more, gene pools are, are not only hitched to those species right around them, they also have interdependent relationships with gene pools clear on the other side of the tree of life. So consider the Tian Shan white clawed brown bears. They live in the wild fruit forests of Central Asia. They devour large sweet fruits and then spread their seeds far and wide. The heftier and more sugary the individual fruit, the more likely the bears select it and spread it. Over millions of years, this natural selection gradually produced the wild ancestor of probably guessed it, apples. So what is it that I hold in my hand? Is it merely an expression of its DNA, which has been shaped by brown bears over the millennia to produce gobs of sugar? Looking deeper, perhaps we should see this as a vessel for that sugar which in essence is just radiant energy from our star that's been temporarily captured in fragile chemical bonds. Looking deeper still, perhaps we should perceive this as the carbon atoms that make up the chemical bonds. Well, they were created by the fusion of helium nuclei within the core of red giant stars and then strewn throughout the universe in violent and wondrous supernovae. 
that stellar fuel, those helium nuclei, they emerge 400,000 years after the singularity known as the Big Bang. This apple is quite literally hitched to everything in this universe. So what does it mean <laughs> for you and I if, in the words of William Blake, there are worlds in a grain of sand, if I can hold infinity in the palm of my hand, perhaps thinking in terms of you and I is that pervasive illusion again. And Bodhi, Bodhi was right all along. Everything is apple. And just like this apple, we're connected to something so much bigger than ourselves. Albert Einstein said that when we experience our thoughts and our feelings as something separated from the rest, it's a kind of optical delusion of our consciousness. This delusion of an independent self can make you feel awfully alone when you look up at those stars. But science itself points to a reality that is fundamentally interconnected. It provides us an empirical foundation that says, we're not alone. <laughs> we're, we're united with this cosmos and we carry it within us. So my hope today is that you two find a bit of joy and some comfort in contemplating this oneness. And, and I encourage you to every now and again, try and see this for what it truly is, for what we are and take a bite of sunshine. Cheers. <laughs>